So I'm going to talk about uh, what every programmer needs to know about security and where to learn it. More specifically, I'm going to be talking about what every web programmer needs to know. Um, and even though the talk is uh, titled uh, Every Programmer, it's really relevant for software architects, developers, uh, engineers, uh, however you want to call it. Um, I, um, I've given other editions of this talk in which uh, the talk has taken on a slightly different title. Uh, in some cases, it's taken on the title uh, Emerging Security Vulnerabilities and, and Their Impact to Business. And so regardless of uh, which title you're more interested in, you should get, uh, uh, you should get something out of the talk. Um, all the uh, slides and uh, a lot of the information I'm going to talk about uh, is also available on my website at neildeswani.com. And I'll be giving you an URL for another website in which you can get uh, more, more of the information. Uh, let's see. So let me go ahead and, and get started. Um, one of the reasons that I'm very passionate about this space is because I look at many of the press releases that one sees. Uh, and uh, given the string of security vulnerabilities that we've seen over the past couple of years, uh, sometimes I look at it and I wonder whether or not the sky is falling. To give you uh, a couple data points, uh, there's a company called uh, TJX. TJX is a holding company for many retail department stores like TJ Maxx and Marshalls. And uh, they got uh, attacked in a pretty major way. What the uh, cyber criminals were doing in their case was they were parking cars outside of the retail branches. And they would capture traffic that was going by on the retail branch's Wi-Fi network. Uh, the retail branch was uh, using um, uh, Wi-Fi to transmit credit card numbers from the point of sale station to their back end servers. And it was uh, attempting to protect this communication using uh, WEP, the Wired Equivalency Protocol, that was part of one of the original 802.11 standards. Um, of course, uh, the security community has known that this protocol has been broken since 2001-2002 uh, because of the fact that it uses the RC4 stream cipher in a very bad way. It doesn't correctly seed the RC4 state table. And as a result, if attackers are able to simply gather enough packets, uh, they're able to uh, kind of work backwards and figure out what the, what the state table is. And so once they've done that, they can pretty much see all the traffic that goes by. So uh, you know, there, there's a lot of details that have been coming out uh, about this attack in, in spurts. Um, because there's been a, a class action lawsuit going on against the company, basically because over the time period of the attack, the bad guys were able to steal 95 million credit card numbers uh, from transactions dating all the way back to 2002. And that's a very significant um, number of credit card numbers. In fact, this has probably been the worst uh, cyber attack of all time, uh, given some, some measures. Um, another, another rather spectacular data point uh, occurred back in uh, June 2005 when Card Systems, a credit card payment processor, was, uh, was attacked. Uh, they basically, you know, when you swipe your credit card, there's a number of gateways through which your credit card number goes through to get authenticated. And Card Systems was one of uh, those uh, processing companies that was along that chain. Uh, they had a database of about 43 million credit card numbers. And uh, their database stored these credit card numbers unencrypted. Uh, and there, there, there was, really wasn't, uh, you know, uh, while that might have been problematic in, it, in itself, um, things became really bad when somebody at the company decided to connect a website to that database. Uh, the website had a bunch of forms on it which allowed users to uh, see some of this information, you know, register. Uh, of course, the attackers went to these web pages and they didn't enter their email address or other such data into the forms, they entered database commands, and they tickled the database just right so that their commands got executed. What they did is they dropped a script on the card system's backend database that, uh, that basically uh, ran every day and would email them a couple thousand credit card numbers. Uh, this went on for about six months before the company noticed. And uh, once they uh, did notice, um, a lot of bad things happened to them. Basically, Visa and MasterCard canceled their contracts with their company. Their revenues dropped nearly to zero. Uh, the company um, went out of business. Their assets were acquired by uh, CyberSource. Um, you know, in the attack, uh, there were about 263,000 credit card numbers that were stolen, but you know, all 43 million of the credit card numbers in their database were, were exposed to the attack, and customers needed to be notified. Um, let's see. Uh, th th this attack was due to uh, SQL injection. I'll talk more about SQL injection uh, later on. 
Um, but you know, you might uh, think, oh, you know, 2005 was a long time ago. We must have learned all our lessons since then. Uh, unfortunately, if you, you enter SQL injection into a site like news.google.com, you'll see articles and articles of, of recent vulnerabilities, uh, perhaps not as big, um, you know, not as much, uh, not as many compromised records, but, but still quite significant. In fact, there's a website um, at uh, privacyrights.org which has kept a very good chronology of data breaches that have occurred over the past three years. And uh, when I gave a, an earlier version of this talk, uh, you know, three or four months ago, uh, that uh, web page had reported that there were about 153 million uh, compromised uh, user records uh, over the past couple of years, and I just checked earlier today, and there were 215 million compromised records. Uh, if you if you look back over their records and and just look at the year 2006, there were over 300 security uh, re reported security incidents, and um, that was just in one year. So pretty much every business day, there was some major. Uh, security vulnerability. So given all of this, uh, I hope that you can see why I sometimes feel that the sky is falling. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit of what I'm going to cover in this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, SQL injection, the type of threat that was behind the card systems case. I'll also talk about cross-site request forgery, um, a very significant uh, web-based vulnerability that uh, you know, many sites uh, need to defend against. Um, since I'm going to be telling you about real attack methods, um, uh, of course, you should not try these attacks on real production sites. You should try them on your test and your development versions. Um, after talking about SQL injection and cross-site request forgery, I'll go on to talk about some trends in uh, security vulnerabilities, and then I'll tell you where you can learn more. I'll point you to some courses, books, and websites. Um, and by the way, for, for, for those of you that, uh, that are here, we have copies of one of the books, uh, a book that I recently uh, published uh, together with Christoph Kernan and Anita Kesvan this past February. We have them in the back for you, and uh, we, can, we can provide those to you. Um, for those of you that are in the virtual world, um, I'll tell you where you can get it. So let me start off by talking about SQL injection. Uh, so you can imagine a typical two-tier web architecture in which you have a web browser that connects to a web server. Uh, the, the web server might ask the user for a username and password. The uh, web server might then want to make a query to a database to find out if that indeed is an authentic username and password, and uh, might do so using uh, a query like this, uh, select password from the user's table where the username matches uh, the username that was provided uh, by the user, where the dollar sign username is simply a, a placeholder for a variable. And then, uh, depending upon the response that the database gives, the web server might uh, be able to check or will be able to check whether or not the credentials are authentic and, and decide what to do uh, with the user. Um, you know, for those of you that have some uh, security uh, background, you know that, uh, well, we probably don't want to get the password uh, in the clear from the database. We probably want to get a hashed and salted version of it. Um, you know, uh, so, 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 so of course, uh, this is just a uh, straw man example. Now, uh, if this is the way that the application works, then you can imagine that the attacker might attack the application as follows. Instead of entering a quote unquote regular username, the attacker will enter the following for the username, uh, quote, semicolon, drop table users, semicolon, hyphen, hyphen, and enter something for the password. Doesn't really matter what. Of course, what happens when this username gets plugged into the previous statement that we uh, had on the slide, uh, we see that the quote will terminate uh, this string literal, the semicolon will terminate the first SQL statement, the drop table user semicolon makes up the se a second SQL statement, the hyphen hyphen comments out the quote that the application had put in, and if this actually gets executed, it'll wipe out the user's table, resulting in a denial of service attack, uh, and legitimate users will then no longer be able to log into the database. Uh, so that, that's a, a you know, pretty basic, uh, straightforward SQL injection attack. These attacks are, are so uh, prevalent and are fairly well known that uh, you know, this, um, uh, a, a colleague of mine forwarded me this uh, cute cartoon at this URL, and it kind of uh, makes fun of a situation between a, um, let's see, a school administrator and the mother of an uh, of a, of a interesting student. The, um, the, the school calls and says to the mom, you know, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Mom says, 
oh dear, did we did he break something? Uh, in a way, um, you know, the question that gets asked is, uh, did you really name your son Robert? Quote, paren, semicolon, drop table students, <laughs> semicolon, hyphen, hyphen. Uh, oh yes, uh, little Bobby tables we call him, and. Uh, the school admits that, uh, well, they've lost this year's student records. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. So the mom's advice is you better learn how to, how to sanitize your database inputs. Now, you know, when looking at this kind of problem, you might think, oh, you know, I, I, we can solve this problem easily. You know, we should, we should just uh, you know, look for quotes and semicolons and such characters and filter them out, right? And uh, let, me, let me provide an example in which uh, a, a SQL injection attack would still be very easily possible even if that kind of filtering was going on. So uh, let's take another uh, example application. Let's say we have an application which uh, allows you to order pizzas online. And the application might have some functionality which allows you to look at your pizza order history, right? So, uh, there might be some web form in which you can choose the month, and then you hit the view button, and then you'd like to see all the pizzas that you ordered in that month. Well, you might imagine that the HTML for, uh, you know, for this application uh, might look as follows. There's a, a, a post form. It has a, a number of uh, options that one can select from in this drop-down menu, uh, where um, once the user selects, uh, something, it uh, fills in a value for the month. The month is a number from 1 through 12. And then there's a submit button. And uh, the uh, web browser would make an HTTP post request uh, passing the uh, month provided by the user. Now, you might imagine that the SQL query behind that web form to show the user the results looks something like this. It might look like select pizza toppings quantity order day from the orders table. Uh, you know, where the user ID happens to be the user that's logged in, and the order month equals 10, where the 10 came from one of the values in the HTML form. Now, of course, what the attacker can do is, um, uh, you know, modify the form, you know, save the HTML, modify the HTML such that the value for one of the months is uh, 0 or 1 equals 1, and then the uh, attacker can reload the form and hit submit, or an attacker can use uh, tools like wget or curl to issue a similar HTTP request. Um, and you can imagine that what happens is when this uh, 0 or 1 equals 1 gets substituted into the query, um, we end up with a, with a bad situation. Um, the, the 0, uh, since 0 doesn't correspond to a real month, will end up bringing back no results. But the or 1 equals 1 will match uh, basically um, you know, all the, all the rows in the table. So the one thing to notice here is that because and takes precedence over or, when the order month equals zero uh, predicate is combined together with the and with the user ID, this entire clause is false. And or one equals one now applies uh, to the entire table and is true. So what will get returned is all of the pizzas that have been ordered by every user on the site. And you might get a uh, a form like this. So you can see um, you know, uh, all the pizzas, all the toppings, quantities, and order days. Now, while this might not be so bad for a site from which you order pizzas, imagine if this was a medical records database. Um, now the attacker gets to see uh, all of the medical records from all of the users, um, which can be a pretty bad deal. So. Uh, so SQL injection attacks uh, can, be, can be quite damaging. In fact, they can get a lot worse. Even for a pizza delivery site, uh, you can imagine that the, you, that, that the attacker might want to get a hold of all the credit card numbers that uh, were used to order these pizzas. And so the attacker could input uh, 0 and 1 equals 0, union select card holder number expiration month expiration year from credit cards. Uh, what happens when this is provided as the input and uh, you know, filled into the previous query. Well, the 0 and 1 equals 0 will basically, uh, well, it'll result in no results. Um, but what happens in the second part of the statement is uh, there's a union, and it poses a second query, merges it to the first set of results, which is in fact null, uh, and takes the uh, cardholder names, the credit card numbers, the expiration months, and the expiration years, and uh, merges it into the uh, the, the table. One thing to note is that the data types selected here exactly correspond to the data types in the previous query. So the database will go ahead and happily execute it because there's no 
uh, syntactic errors. And so if we look at the results that the attacker will get, um, it might look something like the following. Uh, there would be a you know table which uh, is supposed to show pizza order histories, but what will it'll end up in showing is the uh, cardholder names, the credit card numbers, uh, the, uh, the expiration dates, and the expiration years. And so this is how these types of uh, attacks occur, where the bad guy is able to get uh, everybody's credit card numbers, um, uh, although a little bit uh, indirectly, but still pretty easily possible. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, all these queries uh, did not have any quotes or semicolons or hyphens or any funny characters. Yet, um, you know, yet, and yet, um, so they were able to be used for attacks. So, you know, even if you did try to filter out these kinds of characters, it wouldn't have helped uh, your application. So, basically, what this tells us is that blacklisting as an approach does not work, right? Um, Instead, you should use uh, whitelisting instead of blacklisting. Instead of trying to blacklist and filter out certain characters, what you should do is specify the set of inputs that are valid. So, uh, you know, why doesn't blacklisting work? Well, uh, it doesn't prevent many of the attacks that we've seen. Uh, you could fill, you could forget to filter out some of the characters. You know, each database has its own set of meta characters. Um, and it could end, also end up providing, uh, preventing some valid input. You know, why shouldn't we allow our user to have the username, oh, quote, Brian, right? Um, we want uh, users to have a very personal connection to, to our website, and they, we want them to, to trust us. So th there, there isn't any reason that we shouldn't prevent this kind of input. On the other hand, if you use a whitelisting-based approach, where what you do is specify a set of regular expressions uh, that correspond to valid input, uh, you might be able to do so as follows. So if I'm expecting uh, alphanumeric uh, data, then I could specify the following regular expression. If I'm expecting, say, a, an order month, I might use this uh, next regular expression here, where the first character has to be a, a 0 or a 1, and then the rest can be a, a 0 through 9. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't take this uh, too literally. The idea is that we should use regular expressions to specify valid sets of input. Um, I'm sure we could spend, uh, you know, we could uh, do a much better job of writing regular expressions. Um, the other thing that I'd encourage you to do so is that when you're writing these kinds of regular expressions and building your application, uh, trade them with your colleagues and or trade them with a security professional or a, or a vendor that you're working with um, because writing these kinds of regular expressions is, is, is really hard. And so you should try to break each other's regular expressions and break each other's whitelisting. Uh, another place where you can use these regular expressions in addition to your code is uh, if you're running a web application firewall, let's say you're using uh, Apache's mod security, you can specify uh, mod security rules that uh, correspond to these regular expressions uh, such that even if uh, the application didn't uh, you know, do the whitelisting, you can have your web app firewall uh, do it. So uh, whitelisting is extremely important. The other thing that you need to do to uh, prevent uh, SQL injection attacks is use escaping properly, right? So if you did want to allow this uh, username like oh quote Brian, or you want to allow a username like oh quote Connor, uh, it's important to take advantage of the escaping functions that your database provides you with. So uh, you know MySQL as well as other databases will will provide functions which will take the uh, take an expression with meta characters in it and uh, convert it to an escaped version. In this particular case. Uh, the single quote is changed into a double quote, and what this means to the database, oh, quote, quote, Connor, is please interpret this double quote as a single quote uh, piece of data. Do not interpret it as something that is, you know, changes from data to control. So it's important to use uh, escaping uh, properly. Of course, escaping only really works for string inputs in the case where you're accepting integers and such things. Um, you should um, you should do um, the following. Um, you should take advantage of uh, you know this third mechanism here um, uh, called prepared statements, where what you can do is specify a query template. So you could say I'd like to have a query uh, that has this form select pizza toppings etc from the orders table where the user ID equals question mark. Uh, the question mark here is a bind variable. And the order month is also a question mark. It's also a bind variable. A bind variable is simply a placeholder for data. So once you've specified the query template, you can then uh, say, OK, I'd like to set the first placeholder to the current user ID. And I would like to set the second placeholder to uh, the order month. Uh, some things to note here. Uh, these are typed, first of all. 
Um, so if the type doesn't match, the database will complain. And secondly, uh, if regardless of what is specified here, it will always be interpreted as data. If you put quotes in there or other meta characters, they will not be interpreted as instructions to change to, to control and change the structure of your SQL query. So, um, so uh, you know, taking advantage of this pattern is good. In fact, you could imagine in your application what you might do is you might have a file where you specify all of your query templates uh, and you're only allowed to construct, uh, you know, application code that takes advantage of the, of the query templates so that you shouldn't need to see any SQL in your code. And that might be a good design pattern to take uh, advantage of to, to mitigate SQL injection attacks. So. Um, I've talked a bit about uh, SQL injection, but there's, uh, there's, there's more to learn as well. There's more approaches that you can take advantage of. So for instance, you should uh, you know, limit privileges wherever you can. For instance, uh, you should not give your web application server the root password to your database. You should not have uh, the web server logged in as an administrative uh, account. Um, you know, instead, you know, and the reason for that is if the, if the bad guy is able to do a SQL injection attack, you don't want the bad guy to be logged in with administrator access. Uh, instead, what you can do is, uh, you know, create a separate account just for, uh, you know, the functions that that particular web server needs to, needs to do. So for instance, if you only need to provide read-only access, then create a database account for which that user only has been granted read-only access. Um, so, so limiting privileges uh, is, a, is a good thing to do as a part of a, a defense in depth approach to, to mitigating SQL injection. Uh, another thing that you should do is make sure that you harden your database server and you harden your operating system on which your application is running. Uh, this is extremely important simply because, uh, for instance, some databases like Microsoft SQL Server, uh, when they're deployed, uh, they're deployed with all kinds of interesting functionality turned on. So uh, when Microsoft SQL Server is shipped, for instance, uh, you can, from an SQL prompt, uh, issue a command which will uh, invoke a command shell, uh, give you direct access to the operating system. You can, uh, from SQL, invoke commands which will go ahead and create outbound network connections. Uh, you know, and uh, that can be used also to port scan your internal network. So uh, make sure that before you deploy your production application, all of these things are, are shut off. There's no reason to, to, to ship a production application with uh, all of this uh, interesting functionality turned on. Uh, you might ask, what else do I need to learn about SQL injection? Well, there's things like uh, second order SQL injection where uh, in the attacks that I've shown, the bad guy tries to send in malicious input that gets executed right at the time that it's entered. Uh, a second order SQL injection attack is one in which the bad guy uh, sends in some data that might actually get properly escaped and such and get stored into the database. And then at a later point, the attacker uh, you know, tickles the application to use that data in some other SQL command, which may not validate the input again and get it to actually execute. I have a, there's a nice example of this in the SQL injection chapter of my book. Um, you, can, uh, you can take a look at that if you want to learn more about second order SQL injection. Um, there's also blind SQL injection. In order to do the attacks that I've talked about, uh, you might make the observation that the attacker needs to know something about the database schema. And blind SQL injection is, an, a, is a technique that you can use to learn, uh, that attackers can use to learn the schema of the database. Basically, it takes advantage of the fact that um, databases store metadata about the tables and other tables. And you can ask the database queries like, you know, are there any tables in the database that, um, that uh, you know, start with the letters M to Z? And the database will respond yes or no. Uh, and then depending upon the response, let's say it responded yes, I can basically use binary search to locate the first character of the table name of the database. And then basically do that successively for each character. And I can basically get table names and uh, other such uh, data that I need to, to mount attack. So uh, defending against blind SQL injection is, is also uh, an important thing to learn about. So um, I've talked a bit about uh, SQL injection. Um, I, um, I've mentioned that uh, SQL injection can occur due to unvalidated input. Um, there's other types of attacks that can occur due to unvalidated input. For instance, cross-site scripting is another uh, very popular attack uh, that can be done against web applications, which relies on unvalidated input. Um, but I'm not going to talk uh, more about uh, unvalidated input types of errors. I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to, to go learn more. Um, I, I'll talk instead about a, um, 
you know, a vulnerability uh, called cross-site request forgery that's due to design errors. And we've started seeing an increase in, in, in these types of attacks. Uh, and they are, uh, you know, they're, they're very damaging because in some cases it might not even be apparent that there's an attack going on. Um, that said, there are many other types of uh, vulnerabilities both in web applications and other types of uh, applications that can occur due to you know failure for checking for boundary conditions appropriately, failure to do exception handling properly, um, failure to do access validation checks, etc. So um, you know, but I'll just give you a, a sample of cross-site request forgery attacks. So um, let me uh, let me ask: are, are there any questions about SQL injection before I go ahead and proceed? No. Okay. Let me talk about cross-site request forgery. So let's assume we have a scenario in which we have a, an application hosted at a, a website called bank.com. Um, I don't own bank.com. I don't know what's running at bank.com. I'm just using it as an example. Uh, but let's say that our user Alice uses bank.com. And uh, Alice logs into bank.com with a username and password. Once Alice logs in with a username and password, uh, the website, after Alice is authenticated, will send Alice a cookie. And then when Alice's browser makes uh, subsequent HTTP requests to bank.com, uh, Alice, uh, Al you know, the cookie will get looked at by the website. And if the cookie is indeed authentic, uh, then the website knows that it's Alice and uh, allows Alice to do what she needs to. And as you might know, there's many applications that have this uh, architecture for their authentication. Um, let's also uh, assume uh, that Alice um, also happens to, while she's logged into bank.com, uh, she gets lured. Uh, her, her browser gets lured to load some web content from a site called evil.org, um, say in a second browser window. And uh, let, let's keep that scenario in mind, and let's see what can happen. So let's say that Alice is logged into bank.com. Her browser places a request for a login.html page. This login.html page has a form on it, uh, which uh, accepts, say, a username and password. Uh, she goes ahead and enters the username and password. That username and password is uh, passed to bank.com uh, as part of uh, invoking a, um, you know, an authentication script. Right, The form's action will be off. And uh, bank.com's authentication script will run. It'll look at the username and password. It'll check it in its database. And uh, let's say bank.com determines, hey, you know, Alice is indeed an authentic user. Uh, what uh, bank.com does is it sends uh, back a cookie to Alice's browser saying that, OK, you're logged in, and your session ID happens to be this, uh, 40A4C04D. By the way, this is way too short to be a uh, session identifier. You should use a much longer one. Um, but uh, let's say that this uh, cookie gets sent back to, to Alice. Um, Alice then might uh, get back a, you know, a web page as uh, part of this response um, that allows her to do all kinds of things at her bank's website. So she might, say, decide to view her balance. Um, so uh, she clicks the link that says View Balance. And her browser makes a request to bank.com. And of course, the way that cookies work is because this, uh, pre this session ID cookie was handed to her saying that um, uh, every time that the browser comes back to bank.com, the browser should submit the cookie. So the browser faithfully ab abides by that. And it says, oh, I'm calling the view balance script. I'm making a request to bank.com. Oh, I should send the bank.com cookie. So the bank.com cookie gets sent with the request. Bank.com. Uh, you know, sees the session ID, says, oh, I, I know this session ID. I give it to Alice. It must be Alice that's uh, attempting to view her balance. Uh, and she's already authenticated. So I'm going to go ahead and tell her her balance is $25,000. So everything's, uh, you know, just fine so far. But let's look at what can go wrong when um, her browser happens to get lured to evil.org. Um, let's say that the same situation occurs. Uh, she goes to log in. Um, she provides her username and password. Uh, Alice uh, enters her username and password. She is given a cookie with a session ID because her username and password were valid. And uh, let's say Alice is viewing uh, her bank's web page. And uh, let's say while she's doing that, she happened to receive an email and she clicks uh, some link in the email. And the link uh, is a link to evil.org, and it lures her to view a web page at evil.org while she's logged into bank.com. So 
uh, her browser makes a request to say uh, an HTML file, to get an HTML file called evil.html from evil.org. Evil.org sends back a page with some HTML in it. Uh, and I've um, slightly sacrificed technical actors here for clarity of explanation. But basically, evil.org might uh, you know, send back some interesting content on the page so that Alice thinks everything's fine. But uh, that page has some, say, combination of HTML and JavaScript, which tells her browser to go load uh, the resource specified by this URL, httpbank.com slash paybill, uh, question mark, address equals 123 Evil Street, and amount is $10,000. So Alice's browser receives this web page. And being a faithful browser, the browser wants to render this web page for Alice. So uh, the browser says, oh, OK, uh, I should go access bank.com, and I should, um, I should access this pay bill script. Um, now, uh, you'd hope this wouldn't work. But the way this does work in reality is that since the browser now makes a request to the pay bill script at bank.com, it says, oh, I'm making a request to bank.com. Uh, Alice is logged into bank.com. I should send the bank.com cookie. And so the browser uh, sends that cookie together with this payable request uh, with parameters of the attacker's choice. In this case, uh, what ends up happening is, um, is uh, it's basically an instruction to bank.com saying, please send the attacker $10,000 to their address. Um, and when bank.com receives this request, it looks completely authentic from the standpoint of bank.com. Um, there is uh, very little or nothing in this request uh, that bank.com can distinguish, uh, can use it to distinguish from you know, Alice clicking the link for paying the bill herself. And so bank.com happily abides and says, OK, payment sent. And um, you know, Alice just got cheated out of $10,000. Uh, so that, that's pretty darn bad. Um, why did this happen? Well, you know, there's things in the browser like the same origin policy, which will prevent evil.org from being able to read the content that is given to Alice ba uh, from bank.com. But what the same origin policy failed to protect against in this case is evil.org making a write request to bank.com. Um, uh, you know, when, when uh, evil.org uh, had this link for, for paying the bill, um, you know, it, it, uh, it basically got executed. So being able to make write requests is still very, very damaging. Um, now, what kinds of applications need to worry about cross-site request forgery? Well, basically, any application uh, that stores user data um, profiles. So for instance, uh, you know, Facebook uh, would need to worry about this. Um, many other sites need to worry about this, uh, you, know, uh, you know, MySpace, uh, Orkut, et cetera. Uh, they, they all need to protect against uh, these kinds of attacks. Um, Let's see. So, uh, you know, sites that also allow you to do financial transactions are are also susceptible to, to this kind of an attack. Uh, so, how do we protect against it? Um, or actually, before I tell you how to protect against it, I'm going to tell you about um, how how uh, cross-site request forgery can be even more damaging. How many of you have heard of drive-by farming? One person nodding their head and. Well, is this like uh, word shopping or you know, sort of similar? You know, you're looking for open net. That is war driving. War driving. War driving. War driving is where you, uh, you know, kind of drive around and try to find wireless networks that are not protected. Uh, but this is drive-by farming. This is a little bit different, right? So in this attack, um, the bad guy takes advantage of the fact that uh, when most people buy their home wireless router, they just, you know, plug it into their, uh, you know, phone line or whatever it happens to be, uh, their DSL modem. Uh, together with their wireless router, they just plug it in, and they don't bother to change the default username and password. Um, and while we all know that's bad, um, let, let me tell you one reason why it can why it can be really bad. So basically, uh, what the attacker can do is, um, you know, if the user can get lured to evil.org, um, evil.org can basically send the user a page which says which has some a combination of HTML and JavaScript on it, which says. Hey, um, make a request to 192.168.0.1, the address for the home router. 
and um, you know try to try to do some kind of a write. You know, and um, the attacker isn't able to read what happened, but the attacker can specify things like on error clauses. And so basically, what the attacker can do is send out a bunch of queries to see well where is the home router running, and if and when it finds the home router, it can basically issue a write request saying please try to log in with the default username and password. Okay. Um, what does the attacker do once, um, once they can log in with the default username and password? What the attacker does in drive-by farming is the following. The attacker uh, says, please change the default DNS server to a DNS server that I own. Right? Now, regardless of which site the user decides to go to, bank.com, brokerage.com, whatever it happens to be, the attacker can serve his own version of that simply because uh, you know, the, 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 the home router is now relying on the attacker to translate the domain name to the IP address. So the, the user is just totally owned at this point. And uh, even worse, uh, th th there may be no way for the user to realize this. Um, the important thing to realize here is this drive-by farming attack, um, it's, it's farming. Farming is uh, basically taking control of uh, the user's DNS. It's drive-by because it happened when the user just viewed a web page. Um, but what happened is it, it's basically a cross-site request forgery attack uh, in which the quote-unquote website that was attacked was the home router's uh, web administration console. Uh, and the write request was one in which the attacker said, please change the DNS settings. Um, so uh, this was some good work done by uh, Sid Stam, uh, Zuli Ramzan, and Marcus Jacobson. And uh, you know, uh, <laughs> all the more reason to make sure you don't use default credentials for your, for your home routers. So now that uh, we've talked about uh, you know, exactly how bad cross-site request forgery can be, uh, let me talk a little bit about how you prevent uh, cross-site request forgery. So you know, earlier on, I said that, well, when bank.com gets the, gets the uh, forged request from evil.org, you know, it's virtually indistinguishable to bank.com. But there is one thing that could be different. The one thing that could be different is that HTTP says that uh, you know, a referrer can be specified. So uh, in the usual case, when Alice is logged into bank.com and only bank.com and didn't get lured to the site, and uh, Alice clicks pay bill, what happens is uh, the browser will make an HTTP request and specify that bank.com is in fact the referrer. Um, so you might argue, hey, well maybe we could use the HTTP referrer headers uh, to uh, to check whether indeed uh, bank.com made the request or did evil.org make the request. Uh, but this doesn't uh, work very well in practice, uh, in practice simply because, uh, well, first of all, you, know, you shouldn't trust the client. That's like rookie mistake number one in security. Uh, and, and the referrer is specified by the client. Uh, but secondly, um, there's lots of good reasons for the referrer header to not be there. Let's say that the user is interested in anonymously browsing websites and happens to be using an HTTP proxy. Uh, if, the, if, if that's the case, then um, it's most likely the case that the HTTP proxy will go ahead and strip off the referrer headers so you can't tell where the user is coming from. Uh, and so it's not very practical to try to prevent uh, cross-site request forgery by uh, looking at referrer headers unless you want to alienate some part of your user base uh, and make the rookie mistake of trusting the client. Um, so that, uh, that actually won't work. Um, you might ask, well, you know, I'm, I'm, let's say I'm running Apache and I'm running a web application firewall. Uh, is there some way that I can use my web application firewall at the server uh, to prevent this kind of attack? Maybe similar to using reg regular expressions to prevent SQL injection attacks. And, and the answer, unfortunately, is that this doesn't help either simply because, uh, you know, the, the request looks completely authentic to bank.com and its web application firewall. So, so that won't help either. Um, let me talk about some things that you can do. Uh, one thing that you can do to prevent cross-site request forgery is you can ask the user to provide a secret that only they would know as part of uh, the request. So for instance, um, if we ask the user to enter their password again in, before we allow the bill payment to take place, um, then the attacker would be out of luck unless the attacker already has the user's password, right? So if we ask the user to enter their password again before we allow the bill payment, uh, then the attacker doesn't know what, what password to, to substitute in. Um, so, so that's a, uh, an, an approach that can work. 
Um, you know, and of course, if the attacker already knows the user's password, then it's kind of game over anyway. They could probably do much stuff. So uh, asking the user to validate the action um, by specifying a secret that's only known to the server, bank.com and, and Alice, is a, is a legitimate approach. So that's OK. Uh, another approach is to do validation via a, an action token. And the idea here is we could take uh, you know, some cryptographic signature checksum and, you know, how to build this action token right is, uh, is a little bit tricky. You know, uh, consult chapter 10 of uh, my book. Um, uh, Christoph Kern did a great job in, 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 in helping co-author that uh, chapter. Um, but basically what you can do is use a server-side secret at bank.com to compute a uh, cryptographic checksum that gets sent in the uh, response to Alice and uh, appears in the form. So when the user hits submit, um, it's not just the cookie that needs to get submitted. It's this cryptographic checksum that's also one of the form field parameters. And the idea there is that, well, the attacker won't know what value to substitute in simply because it was computed by a secret that's only known to, to bank.com using, using some secret key. Um, so, so that's an al also another approach. Um, I went over that pretty quickly. Uh, please feel free to ask me afterwards if you have questions about how to do that. Um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, there, there's lots of sources you can consult. So I've talked about SQL injection, and I've talked about cross-site request forgery, and I hope, I, I hope that I'm convincing you that uh, you know, there's lots of very serious web application vulnerabilities to worry about, and that it makes sense to audit your application for, for these kinds of things, and to design it uh, from the get-go uh, to have defenses against these kinds of attacks. Um, but let's step back for a second and think about, uh, and, and look at some data. Uh, with regards to what kind of attacks are the most uh, prevalent. So what I've done is I've pulled some data from the um, MITRE uh, vulnerability database, um, which contains uh, information from over the years, uh, you know, from various companies uh, that reported uh, certain vulnerabilities, as, as well as um, the security research community and uh, lots of other sources. And uh, let's look at what's happened between 2001 and 2006. What we see is that uh, as of last year, the number of cross-site scripting uh, types of attacks have just increased dramatically. And I believe that in this data, uh, cross-site request forgery also fits into that particular bucket. So, so that's kind of uh, web vulnerability uh, enemy number one. Um, you know, the next most prevalent is SQL injection attacks. So it's uh, here with the yellow line and the upside down triangles. Sorry, it's not as viewable as I would have liked it to be. Um, but uh, they're, they're kind of number two, um, but they're pretty closely tied with other types of code injection attacks, namely uh, PHP include attacks, in which uh, you can get a site to, uh, if it doesn't validate certain input properly, include PHP code from, from uh, a site of the attacker's choice. Um, so that, th those are the, the next things to worry about. And then things like denial of service and buffer overflows kind of fall below that. Um, you know, uh, as we're kind of nearing the end of 2007, it'll be interesting to see uh, vulnerabilities uh, nearest database, uh, newest database. Um, in addition to looking at the MITRE database, I also looked at data from other vulnerability databases, uh, like the security-focused vulnerability database. Um, but you know, the, the picture that I just showed you, uh, sh you know, gives you a, a reasonable picture of what's going on. Overall, the number of uh, uh, of, uh, well, the number of web vulner vulnerabilities that we're detecting are increasing, um, and uh, you know the number of attacks may also be increasing. Um, but uh, we're certainly getting better at finding the uh, at, at finding these kinds of vulnerabilities. Um, regardless of which vulnerability database you look at, the big four types of attacks are about the same across all of them. So cross-site attacks like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, cross-site script inclusion uh, are uh, you know number one. Um, uh, you know, and then these are the big four, code injection, uh, memory corruption due to things like buffer overflows, integer overflows, format strings, and, and denial of service. So if you're building web applications, these are the kinds of things that uh, you should be worried about um, today. Uh, tomorrow, the picture might be different. Things might change. And so I think that uh, you know, learning about the, the, the current set of attacks and defending event against your applications today is, is, is a very, very good thing to do. Uh, at the same time, it's important to kind of prepare yourself for the long term. And so um, I'm, I'm going to uh, provide a little bit of information about uh, what you should do if you're an engineer, a developer, a programmer, or an architect uh, responsible for leading a 
uh, team of uh, uh, folks building these kinds of applications, uh, the first thing that you should do is arm yourself with uh, this type of knowledge. Um, and uh, the second thing you should do is you should, for each project, elect a security czar. Um, you know, unless you have one person whose job it is to, to focus on these kinds of issues, uh, a lot of times things can fall through the cracks. So um, you know, elect a security czar for, for your project is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I'm going to chat a little bit more about uh, how, to, how to arm yourself and how to arm your, your security czar if it's not you. So I had mentioned that it's important to defend against the attacks of today. It's also important to prepare yourself to defend against the attacks of tomorrow. And you know, if you ask yourself the question of why we're in the situation that we're in, it's probably it, it, it's partially uh, probably because uh, of the fact that you know uh, the the knowledge of how to do secure design has not been disseminated throughout uh, you know computer science and electrical engineering as as, as prevalently as we would like. For instance, um, how many people learned about um, you know encapsulation and polymorphism? Uh, as part of their computer science degrees. Yeah, pretty much everybody, right? And, and, and the reason that you learned that is so that you could achieve uh, code reuse, extensibility, scalability in some cases, maintainability, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, if I were to ask the same question, um, how many people were required to take a, a security course uh, to get their degree? And actually, I, I, I'm not raising my hand myself. I, it wasn't required for me either. But uh, the number is much, 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 much smaller. In fact, I don't think anybody raised their hand. So um, there, there are certain principles at the heart of secure design, like the principle of least privilege, like fail-safe stance, like how to defend against the weakest link first, how to identify the weakest link first. Um, and it's important that we teach these kinds of principles such that when we're confronted with the next new problem, we have a set of principles to guide us to help us figure out what should be the right uh, solution. Uh, so that we don't have to just rely on the current set of tips and tricks that we know, uh, but um, you know we can together with security professionals figure out what the what the right thing to do is. So uh, once you once you know about how to do secure design, uh, it, it is important to be familiar with the the current set of most prevalent technical flaws, and also be familiar with kind of uh, the current threats out in the field, right? Um, all of these different technical flaws could be used to conduct different types of attacks. For instance, uh, at the beginning of this talk, I provided an example where uh, a SQL injection attack was used to conduct denial of, uh, denial of service. But it can also be used to conduct the data theft. Um, you know, similarly, um, you know, code injection can be used to uh, you know, bypass uh, authentication or authorization, or it can also be used to uh, you know, uh, get information that you're not supposed to, right? So it's important to be familiar not only with the various technical flaws, but uh, all the different ways that they could be used to, to conduct certain attacks. So if this is what every engineer needs to know, the question is, well, where do we learn it? So I'll talk about some courses, certification programs, uh, books, and websites. Uh, of course, the information that I'm providing here is not comprehensive by any means, but, uh, but it is more of a sampling. So if you're interested in security courses, you, um, you, you know, every major university will have courses on cryptography, typically at the higher levels, um, which, is, which is good to know. Um, at the same time, if we looked at the types of vulnerabilities that we've been seeing, most of these vulnerabilities or most of the attacks are not about, you know, how do I break the encryption function, right? How do I uh, break the cryptographic checksum? Very few uh, people in the real world uh, are trying those types of attacks. Instead, uh, most of the time, people took advantage of vulnerabilities in software in order to conduct attacks. So we need to get we need to get a lot better at building uh, software. Cryptography is an important part of that, and it's a, it's an important tool we can use to help achieve security. But the software needs to have this inherent uh, characteristic of security in order in order to protect our users. And so uh, some universities like Berkeley and Stanford have uh, more systems oriented security courses at. Uh, at Stanford, Dan Bonet teaches CS155. Uh, US, UC Berkeley recently um, uh, you know, uh, provides uh, CS161. Uh, and these uh, teach both systems uh, as well as cryptography to, to provide that set of tools. There is a much more comprehensive list of security courses um, you know, both systems and cryptography oriented uh, at Avi Rubin's website. I encourage you to check it out. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a decently sized list. Um, Given that there's a large um, uh, folks of, uh, I mean, there's a large base of uh, software engineers that um, was not required to uh, learn these types of things uh, when when they were in school, um, which is also the case with me. Um, 
uh, there, there's offerings like the Stanford Advanced Computer Security Certificate that's been created uh, where you can, you don't have to take a semester long course, you go in for one week, uh, very intense, you basically learn how attacks are done, you basically construct attacks yourself, you attack, uh, you know, test websites that have been set up, uh, you then build defenses. Um, and uh, not only can, can uh, the advanced security certificate be taken kind of on campus, but it can also be taken online. Um, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I, I helped Stanford put, to, uh, put this program together. And uh, what this certification program has done is, uh, you know, in, in the old world, uh, we had to kind of create a, uh, a scenario in a lab where people can come in and do attacks against test websites and make sure they don't harm themselves or anybody else. Uh, but what this program has done is created a bunch of VMware images that um, allow you to conduct the attacks in a very isolated fashion, uh, you know, and then build the defenses, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so you know, it, uh, it's very hands-on, and um, you can get more information at this particular uh, URL, proed.stanford.edu, question mark, advanced security. Um, the program, it's divided into uh, two sections. There's a set of core courses um, on things like, you know, using cryptography correctly. Even for security professionals that uh, write code, um, you know, using the cryptography libraries correctly is, is challenging. If you get just one parameter wrong or don't, uh, you know, see it in IV correctly, it could just break the security of your entire scheme. Uh, and then there's other courses on, you know, writing secure code, security protocols, and there's a set of electives. Um, you'll note that one of the electives is securing web, securing web applications. Um, so if the kind, if, if the material in this talk has been of interest to you, that may be of interest. Uh, there's also a course that takes place once a year, and it's, um, it's uh, very fresh. Uh, it's uh, entitled Emerging Threats and Defenses. Uh, and so it talks not all, only about the types of vulnerabilities that I have talked about, but it also talks about um, uh, things like uh, advanced phishing attacks, botnets, etc. Um, there's also uh, a number of other security certification programs out there uh, that I encourage you to check out. One of them is offered by a uh, group called uh, IC Squared. This organization exists strictly to make a uh, certification program called the uh, CISSP available. Um, it's uh, shown to be very good at preparing people for uh, administrative jobs uh, in security um, or government jobs also uh, in security. Um, it's much more broad than just software security. Most of what I've talked about today is software security, but CISSP covers things like um, physical security, telecom security, uh, et cetera. And um, you, know, you, you go in, you learn this, you take a mul multiple choice test, and you can get the certification. Um, another certification, uh, that uh, you might want to be aware of is a fairly new one. Uh, it's called the GIAC Secure Software Programmer, lots of uh, acronyms. Um, and while the certification is fairly new, it's offered by a group called SANS. Uh, it's a security training institute that's actually been around for quite some time. So while the program is new, the institution has been around for a while, uh, they've created something called a secure programming assessment where uh, you, know, you basically uh, learn software security knowledge and uh, take a multiple choice test. It has questions like, uh, you know, here's some code. Uh, does it have a buffer overflow? Yes, in line three, you know, this kind of thing. Um, you know, uh, it, it is fairly new. Their first exam was offered in uh, August 2007, and um, you know, uh, that's something else you can you can check out. Um, let's see. There's also a number of uh, books available. Uh, I mentioned uh, earlier that I, I recently published. Um, uh, foundations of Security, Whatever Programmer Needs to Know, together with uh, Christoph Kern and Anita Kesevan. Um, it uh, spends, um, the, the, the first third of the book is spent on uh, secure design principles, um, secure design methodology, and what it does is it uh, takes an example of a hundred line web server uh, that was, you know, built to kind of just do its job, right? Scenario is a manager tells uh, an engineer, hey, you know, just, just build something that works and go to it. And uh, so, so, so uh, the programmer does that. And of course, there's like tons of vulnerabilities in this thing. And it illustrates, uh, you know, how if uh, certain design principles were followed, those could be, those could be avoided. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's the first third of the book. The second third of the book talks uh, strictly about web applications. Um, it talks about client state manipulation, it talks about cross-site scripting, it talks about SQL injection, uh, it covers a lot of the type of material I, I talked about today. And then the last third of the book uh, provides an introduction to cryptography uh, with the intent of giving you enough security knowledge uh, and enough cryptography knowledge to have a, a, a very good conversation with a security professional in deciding uh, how to build uh, your security protocol and the security for your application. Um, 
Uh, so that's one resource. Uh, I, I've uh, listed two other, or three other very good books here. One is um, Security Engineering by Ross Anderson. Um, one of the great things about this book is it has lots of interesting stories uh, and case studies and examples from uh, you know, security that needed to be designed for nuclear command and control, um, why the security of some early banking systems failed, even though the cryptography was great. Uh, another great thing about the security engineering book is it is uh, freely available online. So, so please check it out. Uh, take advantage of it. Um, Let's see. Um, a second book that's available is um, uh, Viega and McRaw's uh, Building Secure Software. Uh, it was published in 2001. It was kind of the first attempt at bringing together software security knowledge in one place. And it covers uh, you know, things like buffer overflows uh, very well. It covers race conditions, how uh, if there's a race condition, it can be used to, uh, to say, bypass an authorization system uh, due to time of checks, time of use uh, issues. Um, uh, strongly recommended. Uh, I also uh, recommend uh, the Secure Programming Cookbook by Viega and Messer. Um, the Secure Pro Programming Cookbook is great because it has lots and lots of code examples of how to do security sensitive operations. So for instance, if you need to do input validation and escaping, there's code right there that you could uh, you know, pretty much steal um, to, to do proper input validation. It has lots of examples how you should, if you need to use cryptography, and let's say you're using the OpenSSL library, it has lots of examples uh, of calls, how to do calls to the OpenSSL library correctly. Um, so, uh, so, so those are all good books to, to check out. Um, let's see, let me talk about some websites. Um, I, I, um, let's see, one, one website that I want to mention is the OWASP. It stands for the Open Web Application Security Project. And uh, you know it's a very interesting group. Uh, they, they kind of maintain a top ten list of um, you know the most uh, current vulnerabilities. Um, it also um, it, one of the other interesting things about this group is they have a list of uh, you know local chapters in every city. So if you're interested in learning more about security, you can go to once a month meetings where every uh, meeting somebody will be talking about a different topic. Um, so a very interesting group. They're in fact having a conference in San Jose uh, later this week, um, which, uh, which I'll be flying back for to, to serve on a panel there. Um, so it's so a very interesting group. Uh, the, the next thing I want to tell you about is the Security Focus website. Uh, Security Focus is the home of the original bug track vulnerability mailing list. Um, so that's another good site to check out. And um, we also uh, recently launched a site called code.google.com slash edu. And that has um, a introductory web security course. So if you need to, uh, if, if you need to start uh, teaching security courses, this is a great place to, to get some slides. Um, let's see. Um, let me uh, just mention a little bit about the o OWSP top ten. Um, th this group has uh, become much more mature over the years. Um, you know, uh, if you looked at what their top ten list was like back in 2004, like unvalidated input was number one, but unvalidated input describes quite a few different things, right? And you could see that, well, that was dropped from the list and a whole bunch of more specific things, um, you know, like SQL injection, and injection flaws, uh, malicious file execution, et cetera, re replaced it. Um, and you can also see that this top 10 list is also now beginning to mirror some of the information that we're starting to see from vulnerability databases. So, so, so lots of good stuff there. Um, I told you a little bit about security focus. I told you uh, about code.google.com. Um, you know, if you're interested in contributing to this, please let me know. If you're interested in using it, please feel free to just go ahead and download materials from there. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, if you're interested in anything that I talk about uh, at this uh, during this talk, there's um, slides and uh, pointers to all the resources that I mentioned at LearnSecurity.com. Just go there and click on the resources link uh, to check it out. Um, you know, to just kind of uh, conclude here, uh, every engineer, every software professional should be a security practitioner. And um, you know, if you're if you're interested in interesting problems in security, please please come talk to us. Um, my contact is information. My contact information is below. Please feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.